Well, let me just welcome you on behalf of the elders and members of Countryside Bible Church. So grateful that you've chosen to join us over these couple of days. And uh, we're just going to talk shop together. We are committed to the same responsibilities. And we want to learn together, remind ourselves together of what that duty looks like. I want to begin by just turning to the passage that Jonathan mentioned a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 4. It really frames the the foundation for this conference and for what we're going to be doing together. 1 Corinthians 4, and just read with me uh, verses 1 and 2. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants. The Greek word is a word that uh, essentially means assistance, someone who assists another. It was used of lowly assistance in a variety of contexts. Let a man regard us, Paul says, when it comes to our leadership as assistance of Christ and here is the way we assist him we are stewards that is we are house managers those who who take the master's goods and make sure the others who serve him are fed and cared for provided for and our stewardship is of the mysteries of God the plural means we're talking about all of God's word together our chief stewardship as pastors and leaders of the church is God's truth. He says, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. The, the Greek word implies both loyalty to our master and dependable to our duty. Loyal and dependable. And our duty, our chief duty as stewards, as these verses make clear, is how we handle the stewardship of God's word, preaching God's word to his people. And the text goes on to say that Christ is going to evaluate our faithfulness as stewards of his mysteries when he comes. Also, and the the theme of the conference ties these two together, as you can see even on the screen there, one of the chief ways that you and I, as the leaders of Christ's church, show our love to Christ is by feeding his sheep, by caring for his sheep. And our chief duty as shepherds is feeding the flock. You can get away with a lot of things as a shepherd, but if you don't feed the sheep, you're not going to be a shepherd very long. So we must constantly work at this stewardship. One other text to set the table for what we're going to be talking about. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, a very familiar text. I, I just... I just want to remind us of why we're here. 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, he says to Timothy, until I come there in the church in Ephesus, I want you to give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. I want you to read the Scripture. I want you to explain the Scripture. I want you to apply the Scripture. And then he says this, In verse 15, when it comes to this gift you've been given and the responsibility, the place you use it, take pains with these things. The word means to improve by care or study, to cultivate, to practice. And then he says, be absorbed in them. Literally, be in them. Occupy yourself with this. Be devoted to these things. Immerse yourself in them. And then notice why. So that, here's the purpose, your progress. Progress in what? In the public reading, in the explaining of the Scripture, and the applying of the Scripture, so that your progress will be evident to all. That's why we're here. It's so that wherever we are, with the gifts we've been given, the place that we serve, the experience we've had, the education we've received, wherever that is, not one of us in this room has arrived. Our progress needs to be evident to all. And that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm excited to spend these couple of days with you. If you've had the chance to to go to seminary or if you're in seminary, you have accumulated tools in your toolbox, or maybe you didn't have that chance, but you've read and you've given yourself to, to preparation, and you've put tools in your toolbox. Perhaps you've studied the original languages. 
You've studied the biblical content. You've, you've read in systematic theology. You've, you've studied ministry skills like exegesis and so forth. Maybe you built a library of, of both print and digital resources. Learned to use reference books, commentaries, Bible software. All of that is just tools in your toolbox. And that's crucial. But I'm of the firm belief that there's another step required, and that is to learn how to use those tools effectively week after week to yield consistent results. In other words, what I want us to look at over these couple of days is a defined process, a repeatable pattern, regardless of the passage we're teaching, regardless of the length of it or the nature of it, a sustainable approach that can stand up to the long haul of ministry, where you never run out of things to say, a process that will consistently yield predictable results. And what are those results? An understanding of the authorial in intent of the passage you're teaching and a sermon that explains that intention clearly, illustrates it, and applies it to our hearers. Nothing, let me say it this bluntly, nothing is more crucial to our long-term success as preachers than having a practical, repeatable process. Ultimately, the quality of our sermons is only as good as the quality of our process. I want us to walk through the fundamentals of a weekly process for sequential consecutive exposition that ensures consistent quality, encourages freshness each week so you're not saying the same things that you've always said and that remains true ultimately, and this is our chief duty, to the authorial intent of the preaching text. That's where we're going. So let me give you an outline of kind of what we're going to do, an overview. We're going to start by looking briefly at the arguments, defending expository preaching. And this is important because we need to know why it matters. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on the process. We'll start today, the rest of the time today, we'll look at exegesis, studying the biblical text. And then tomorrow, we'll look at exposition, crafting an expository sermon. We'll look at delivery, preaching an expository sermon. What are the key elements in, in delivery? And then we'll look, sort of wrapping it all up, I want to look at the key elements. We're going to cover a lot of material. It's going to be drinking from a fire hose in that fifth session, or, or the, the session, not the fifth session, but the, fish, the fifth element that I'll cover. I want us to step back and say, what are the main things? Let's look at the key elements that are really at the heart of this process, and I want it to be a workshop where we're going to work through some things together and practice on it tomorrow as we cross the bridge between the biblical text and the ancient world into the modern world and the lives of our people. So before we get to the process itself, I first want to lay a foundation. I want to look at the arguments defending expository preaching. Now let me just say here at the outset, I am going to use PowerPoint in our sessions for two reasons. One, it enables me to cover a lot more material because <laughs> uh, you can see it while I say it and I don't have to belabor it. Secondly, you're not going to be able to write all this down, but what we want to do is send you all of the information that you're going to see on the screen. You'll get it in a PDF uh, after the, the conference is over. So take notes. I hope you'll be uh, free to do that, but also know that you don't have to get everything down. You won't be able to, but you'll have it after the conference is done, all right? So let's begin then looking at the arguments for expository preaching. But before we look at the arguments, we have to define exactly what it is we're talking about. What is expository preaching? Haddon Robinson defined it this way, the presentation of biblical truth derived from and transmitted through a historical, grammatical, spirit-guided study of a passage in its context which the Holy Spirit applies first to the life of the preacher and then through him to his congregation. That's a great definition and a thorough one. Here's another from Merrill Unger, 
No matter what the length of the portion explained may be, if it is handled in such a way that its real and essential meaning as it existed in the mind of the particular biblical writer and as it exists in the light of the overall context of Scripture is made plain and applied to the present-day needs of the hearers, it may properly be said to be expository preaching. Now, what are the key elements of those two definitions? To be an expository message, these things must be true. First of all, you obviously have to begin with a biblical text. The Word of God is the sole source of an expository sermon. Secondly, you have to conduct a, a careful exegesis of that text in order to arrive at the author's original intention. Thirdly, you must prepare and present a message that in a clear and orderly way explains the original intent of the passage and applies it to today. So you have to interpret the text literally in its context and then prepare and present a message that in a clear and orderly way explains the original intent of that passage and applies it to today. Calvin put it really well when he said this, since it is almost his only duty to unfold the mind of the writer whom he has undertaken to expound, he, that is the preacher, misses his mark or at least strays outside his limits by the extent to which he leads his readers away from the meaning of his author. It is presumptuous and almost blasphemous to turn the meaning of Scripture around without due care as though it were some game that we were playing. We're not playing a game with the Scripture. It's God's Word. And our job, as he puts it so well, is not to lead our our readers or listeners away from the meaning of the text, but into the meaning of the text. So the essence then of expository preaching is unfolding the meaning and significance of the biblical text. Usually, expository preaching is also systematic. That is, it moves verse by verse, section by section through a book of the Bible. But that invites the big question, why? Why is that? Why not do expository preaching by preaching random verses, paragraphs, and chapters all the time? Is there biblical warrant for ordinarily preaching through books of the Bible? The answer is yes. Let me give you the arguments, and I'm not going to belabor these. I just want to remind you of them. Let's start with the practical arguments. And this is where most people always go. And these are helpful, but they're not convincing because other people may argue that other approaches are practically helpful. But here are some practical arguments. It ensures a completely Bible-centered ministry. That's true. It allows the listener to grasp the logical development of the Word of God as it was inspired by the Spirit so you're following the Spirit's path in the way that he inspired it, inspired the original author. It ultimately covers all the major themes of the Scripture. If you keep preaching verse by verse, you eventually cover all the significant major themes of Scripture. And not only that, but it also provides a balance of emphasis. In other words, if you're preaching verse by verse and you're dealing with themes as the Spirit brings them up, then you're following the mind of the Spirit about what's important as opposed to preaching your pet thing or my, I'm preaching my pet thing. It, it provides a balance of emphasis. You will deal with biblical themes with the same frequency and the same emphasis that God himself has. It forces you to deal with the difficult passages in Scripture. Now, let's just be honest If you are a sequential expositor, there are passages you come to in that process that you would never choose to preach if you were just picking a passage. And we all have those, right? For me, it's giving. I just, because of the abuse of that, I'm just personally uncomfortable with that, and I probably would would not go there except the Spirit compels me to go there because here I am. That's the next passage. There are things like that in your life and ministry too. And, you know, you can't do that. You can't start preaching Ephesians and tell your people, we're going to study Ephesians together. We're just going to skip those first few verses about election. You can't do that. 
And so it forces us to deal with those issues. It teaches the congregation how to read and study the Bible systematically and contextually for themselves. In other words, we set a pattern for their own study, for their own development as we show them what that study looks like as the fruit of our own study and our preaching. It best ensures our own growth as students of the Word, uh, as men of God, and as preachers. I just, I'll be honest with you, if it was only for me and my own soul, I would do consecutive exposition because that's the way my soul is best fed. And I would argue yours as well. And this is very practical. It aids in sermon selection. I mean, let, I don't know about you, but for me, the hardest thing in my ministry life in terms of preaching is when I don't, I don't have a text that I'm required to preach because it's next and I have to choose. I don't want to choose. They're all good. They're all important. As, uh, as my friend Steve Lawson would say, when, you, when you're faced with that choice, every text says, preach me, preach me, preach me. Sorry, Steve. That wasn't, that wasn't a good imitation, but it saves a lot of time in sermon selection. Now, those are practical arguments, and, and they're true but they're not in and of themselves compellingly convincing. So let's move on to the theological arguments. We're getting, I'm building to the real case, but stay with me. The theological arguments. There are several of them. First of all, there's the pattern of inspiration. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that God chose to give us his word in the way he did intentionally. He gave it to us in cohesive consecutive units of thought that we refer to as books. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 13 is a, is a pretty complicated passage, but when you, when you watch it unfold, Paul moves from, from revelation to inspiration to illumination, and he explains the work of the Spirit. But here's his basic point. Both the thoughts and the words that the authors of Scripture used were not ultimately their words, they were the Spirit's thoughts and words. What that means is when you come to one of these books, the words, the order, the structure is the mind of the Spirit. Folks, we can't improve on that. We cannot improve on what the Spirit has given to us. That's verbal inspiration. And if these are the thoughts of God and the very words of God presented in the exact form and order within each book that the Spirit intended, then we can do nothing to improve that. Inspiration argues strongly that our common approach to Scripture be consecutive expository preaching. A second theological argument is the nature of the preacher's role. Our job, men, is not to create an original message. Now, let me just admit to you that this point doesn't argue so much for consecutive exposition as it does for expository preaching, but stay with me. When you think about, first of all, the role of the Old Testament prophets, more than 3,800 times the Old Testament writers introduce their messages with statements like this, the word of the Lord came to The mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Lord says, the Lord spoke, hear the word of the Lord. Again and again, that message is driven home. I think there's a fascinating passage in the early chapters of Exodus where where God is explaining Aaron's role to Moses. And he says, Aaron is going to be like your prophet. You remember this? And he says, you're going to tell him what to say and he's going to speak. For Aaron to be Moses' prophet in that context, he could not speak for himself, and he could only say what Moses told him to say. That's what it meant to be a prophet. That's why when God commissioned Jeremiah, he said, I have put my words in your mouth. A true prophet was one who didn't speak out of his own heart, but who spoke the mouth and words of God, the words that came from the heart and the inspiration of the Spirit. Another part of that development is when you come to the the primary New Testament word for preacher. 
There are 33 verbs that are used in the Greek New Testament to describe biblical preaching, 33 different verbs. But the primary one is caruso, which is normally translated, I preach or I proclaim. Here's what the leading Greek lexicon said that word means. Listen to this. To be a herald, to officiate as a herald, to proclaim after the manner of a herald. What's a herald? It's somebody who speaks for someone who's in authority and just says whatever they were told to say. That's what preaching is. We are passing on the words of God as they have been given. And when you look at the primary duty of New Testament leaders, you see this. Obviously, the apostles were ministers of the word. Acts 6, 4, they were devoted to the ministry of the word. And elders have to be able to teach. They have to labor at teaching and preaching, 1 Timothy 5, 17. They're to pass on the truth of Christianity to others, 2 Timothy 2, 2. We're to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 2. There's our word. This is the primary duty that we've been given. Elders are first and foremost ministers of the word of God. We have only one claim to preach and to demand to be heard, and that is that we are declaring God's truth as he has revealed it. So there are the theological arguments, but let me hasten quickly to go to the historical arguments. The historical arguments. When you look at church history, you quickly see that there was a consistent commitment to consecutive expository preaching. The earliest extra-biblical record of a Christian service was written by Justin Martyr, writing in the mid-2nd century in his first apology. Here's what he writes. On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the person presiding verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Did you hear that? Someone reads the Scripture, then someone verbally instructs, that is, explains the Scripture, and then exhorts, that is, applies. This is what happened in the early church. It was the pattern of some of the church fathers. You know that there were many, unfortunately, who strayed from this pattern, but there were some examples that were worth noting. Augustine, his sermons, for example, are often exceptions to the sort of allegorical approach. For him, um, a sermon was an exposition of Scripture. It wasn't always right in the sense that we wouldn't always agree with his conclusions, but his approach to Scripture was what we're talking about. John Chrysostom was another faithful expositor who just kept preaching the next text that he left off at, according to Hughes Oliphant Old, who wrote the magisterial work on the preaching and teaching of God's Word in the church, a, a seven-volume set that he sort of unfolds the history of that. There were other bright lights, John Wycliffe, William Tyndale. Still, we admit that often in church history, Scripture was buried, buried in tradition, buried in ignorance, abuse, hermene in bad hermeneutics. But some of the church fathers were an example. Then you come to the Reformation, and the pattern of the Reformers is clear. Luther rejected the allegorical method of interpretation. In fact, typically Luther, I love this, Luther said, Origen's allegories are not worth so much dirt, for allegories are empty speculations, the scum of Holy Scripture. He goes on, allegory is a sort of beautiful harlot who proves herself especially seductive to lazy men. <laughs> Isn't that true? Instead, he believed that you ought to take a literal understanding of the text. Calvin, same, placed extreme importance on studying context, grammar, words, parallel passages. One famous sentence of Calvin's puts it this way, it is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. 
That's what the reformers believed, but it's equally clear it's what they practiced. Take Calvin, for example. Calvin's approach was to preach systematically through the books of the Bible, entire books throughout his ministry. Rarely did he find himself not doing that. There were exceptions, but for the most part, he just preached through the Scripture, and he was determined, regardless of how short or long, to preach every verse. Let me give you some examples. Calvin preached 89 sermons on Acts, 65 sermons on the harmony of the Gospels, 174 sermons on Ezekiel, 159 sermons on Job, 200 sermons on Deuteronomy, 353 sermons on Isaiah, 123 sermons on Genesis, 107 sermons on 1 Samuel, and so forth. You get the idea. Sequential, verse-by-verse exposition. Zwingli in Switzerland was the same way. He announced to his congregation that he was no longer going to preach on the prescribed passages that were, that were dictated, but instead he was going to preach on the entire gospel of Matthew verse by verse and from the Greek text in the pulpit in front of him. So this is the pattern of the Reformers. It was also the pattern of the Puritans. G.I. Packer, in his book on the Puritans called A Quest for Godliness, says the Puritan preacher regarded himself as the mouthpiece of God. His task was not imposition, fastening on the Scripture texts meanings they do not bear. Instead, the, the preacher's task was exposition, extracting from his texts what God had encased within them. The Puritans were devotees of continuous exposition, and left behind the magnificent sets of expository sermons. So, there's clearly historical precedent. Now, understand that historical consensus alone is not indisputable evidence, but the fact that many on whose shoulders we stand believed in consecutive exposition is a case, an argument we just can't ignore. So, that's a survey of the historical and the other arguments, but let me quickly bring you to the biblical arguments, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is where our case is made. This is why we do what we do. And there are those who would say that there is no biblical warrant for consecutive exposition. In 2009, Ed Stetzer of Lifeway interviewed Andy Stanley. Stanley had just written a book on preaching at the time. Oh, there's a thought. The interview is more than a decade old, but his controversial comments about preaching continue to show up in social media. Stetzer asks Stanley this, what do you think about preaching verse-by-verse messages through books of the Bible? Stanley's response, guys that preach verse-by-verse through books of the Bible, that's just cheating. It's cheating because that would be easy, first of all, end quote. Now, there's a guy who's never done it. (laughs) Then Stanley added this, this audacious theological assertion, quote, that isn't how you grow people. No one in the Scripture modeled that. There's not one example. So, the question is, is Stanley right? Is verse by verse exposition of books of Scripture a man-made method that we can ignore as we choose. If you had to defend consecutive exposition from Scripture, how would you defend it? Well, let's talk about that. It starts with the pattern of Old Testament worship, and specifically with the ministry of Moses. The first clear example of sequential exposition in Scripture comes from the ministry of Moses. The foundation laid in Exodus 24. Turn there with me. Exodus 24, verse 3. Of course, the people are at Sinai, and God has spoken to Moses. Verse 3 says, Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Now, verse 4, he writes down all the words of the Lord, and after he has written them all down, 
Notice verse 7. This is key. Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. Now, it is impossible to overstate the importance of that. From the very first time that God revealed himself in written form, the consecutive reading of his word became an essential part of the worship of God's people. That's what he did. He wrote it down, and then he read it to them consecutively. He read them what had been written. Moses laid the foundation there by reading God's word to the people consecutively. But but he established a clear pattern of consecutive exposition 40 years later on the plains of Moab. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy records the first sermon series. Look at Deuteronomy 1.1. These are the words which Moses spoke. Now go down to verse 5 because here you have the contents of this book that he spoke. Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook, notice what it says, to expound this law. So now Moses sets out not only to read it as he has already done, but to explain it. And the sermons in Deuteronomy are Moses-inspired sermons on God's law. Uh, If I had time, I could show you he essentially, there are three parts to these sermons. There is remembrance, there is interpretation, and there's exhortation. This is the first sermon series. Moses was not only God's instrument to initiate written revelation, but also to serve as the pattern for all future biblical preaching. So let's continue. The pattern continues not only in Moses' ministry, but in the tabernacle and the temple. Typically, when we think of the tabernacle and, and later we think of the, the temple, what do we think of? We think of the sacrificial system. We think of the sacrifice of the animals and all that was involved in that. But but that isn't all that went on in these places. God demanded that his word be taught at both the tabernacle and the temple. And he assigned this responsibility to the descendants of Levi. Deuteronomy 33.10. They shall teach your ordinances to Jacob and your law to Israel. A crucial part of the Levite's job description was teaching people the word of God. And we learn just how important this was later in Chronicles, because in the book of Chronicles, the writer explains that the decline in the worship of, of the, the true God, Yahweh, was because of the priest's failure to teach the people God's law. Here's a text that'll preach, all right? Second, th- Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 3, for many days Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest, and without law. This is what's happening in American Christianity. Jehoshaphat comes along and initiated reforms to address this issue. Second Chronicles 17, verses 7 through 9, in the third year of his reign, he sent officials to teach in the cities of Judah, and with them the Levites and the priests, They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them, and they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. Jehoshaphat instituted this reform because it hadn't been done. The assignment the Levites had been given wasn't being fulfilled. Now, he sent Levites, but he sent one special group of Levites. He sent the priests. The priests were not only descendants of Levi, as you know, but specifically of Aaron, Moses' brother, and they served in the sacrificial system, but they too were responsible to teach. Leviticus 10, 11, they are to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Some of the Levites were also scribes responsible to archive and copy the law. Who was the most famous of them? Who was the most famous scribe in the Old Testament? Ezra. 
And Ezra's ministry, of course, provides a model for the proper use of the Word of God in the corporate worship. Turn to Nehemiah, and this again, I don't, I'm not going to belabor this, I just want to remind you of it, because you're very familiar with it. Nehemiah chapter 8. You remember that they call the people together, Nehemiah 8, 6, then Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands, they bowed low, worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then these Levites, we're told in verse 7, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the law, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. So they, they read and they translated it in verse 8. That could mean that they translated it from Hebrew into the more familiar Aramaic. More likely it means that they explained it. And we know they did that. Verse 7 says they did that. And that was their responsibility. So Ezra and the Levites established a pattern for the corporate worship of God's people. Read the text, explain the text. Read the text, explain the text. And Paul adds, apply the text. And Moses did that in Deuteronomy. So, this was the pattern. The same is true with Jewish synagogue worship. Worship in the synagogue followed the same pattern. In the first century, the Sabbath service centered on reading and explaining the Scripture. Acts 15, 21, Moses from ancient generations, has in every city, listen to this, those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So they read and they preached from the reading. Philo, the first century Jewish philosopher, describes the typical weekly synagogue worship. Quote, they come to the holy places called synagogues according to their age and order, the young men sit under, their, under the elders at their feet and with a decent composure attend to the hearing. When one taking the book reads and another, one of the most skillful, explains what is not known, end quote. Read, explained. So in the synagogue during the time of our Lord, the most skillful teachers read the Scripture and then explained that portion of Scripture. The typical synagogue service in the first century included readings from both the law and the prophets, and the sermon was connected to those readings. The reading was usually consecutive, following the pattern of Moses, reading through what had been given. Ordinarily, first century synagogues followed a systematic consecutive reading of Scripture from the law and then from the prophets, and then there was a sermon that explained that day's reading. So normal synagogue sermons then were consecutive expositions of Scripture. They weren't always good expositions. Our Lord often took issue with their conclusions, but he never, ever disparaged the pattern of consecutive exposition that they followed. The teacher read the next passage beyond where they ended the previous week and explained it. That was the pattern of synagogue worship, and that's crucial to the next argument, and that is the pattern of Christ. Not only is this true in the Old Testament worship, but even more importantly, in the pattern of our Lord. Hughes Oliphant Old writes, Jesus was preeminently a preacher of the Word. His three-year ministry was, above all, a preaching ministry. And a crucial part of Jesus' preaching ministry was in synagogues on the Sabbath. Matthew 4.23 records this, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. In John 18, 20, Jesus told Pilate, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues. Turn to Luke's gospel. I want to show you how this unfolds in Luke's writing. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. 
And now verse 15 explains the focus of his ministry. He began teaching in their synagogues. The next verse he returns to his hometown, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And notice this, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. You see how he's fitting into the, the synagogue pattern? He stood up to read. He took the book of the prophet Isaiah that was handed to him, opened the book, found the place where it is written, and then verse 20 concludes, he closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the congregation were fixed on him, and he began to say to them. By the word, the word began means Luke doesn't record for us here Jesus' entire sermon. I wish we had it, but that wasn't in, the, that wasn't in God's plan. But in his hometown, Jesus did what was typically done in the synagogue. He read the text and explained it. Jesus was an expository preacher, now, after the people in Nazareth rejected him, Jesus continued teaching and preaching in the synagogues in Galilee. Look down at verse 31. He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. This was his regular practice. Look at verse 44. He kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This was the focus we learned there, not only of his ministry in Galilee, but also in Judea either a reference to the region around Jerusalem or maybe to the entire land of Israel. Luke 6.6 6 adds this, on another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Luke 13.10 again mentions he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Here's what I want you to get. Examine the ministry of Jesus and you're going to find a pattern. Yes, Jesus taught during the week and we find him in all kinds of places, teaching from a boat from the side of the Sea of Galilee and in all kinds of places across the land of Israel. But the primary focus of Jesus' preaching ministry, week in and week out, was preaching in the synagogues. And he participated in the normal routine of synagogue worship, the consecutive reading and exposition of the Word of God. Jesus was a sequential expositor. Don't let Andy Stanley convince you otherwise. Jesus is the pattern of what we're talking about. A third way we see this pattern is in the pattern of the New Testament church. We see it obviously in the ministry of the apostles. In Acts 2.42, the, the people were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Chapter 6, verse 4, you remember they were devoting themselves to the ministry of the Word. Look at, look at Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 5. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Paul here is preaching in the synagogues, just like Jesus did. And what did it look like? Go down to verse 15. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation of the people, say it. And then Paul stood up and did just that. They're following the same pattern our Lord did. This was their ministry as well. You see it in Acts 20, Paul in Troas in Christian worship. And in, also Paul in Ephesus, he did the same thing. And of course, you see that the ministry of the Word is the highest priority for New Testament elders. I mentioned already 1 Timothy 3, 2, they have to be able to teach. 1 Timothy 5, 17, labor in teaching and preaching. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the Word. And we also see this responsibility and priority in the commands that have been given to the church. The Old Testament and the growing body of New Testament-inspired documents were to be read and taught in the first century in the churches. We saw it in 1 Timothy 4, right? Read the Scripture, explain the Scripture, apply the Scripture. But not only were Paul's letters to be read, I'm sorry, not only was the Old Testament to be read and explained, but Paul's letters were as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The clear implication of that is that the reading was to 
drive the explanation, and ordinarily the reading would have been consecutive. That's how letters are written. That's how we read them. That's how they would have read them in the first century. So, let me summarize it this way. The Word has always been central in the life of God's people and in the corporate worship of God's people. And the ministry of the Word has commonly been systematic, consecutive reading and then explaining of God's Word. So don't let anyone try to convince you otherwise that there's no biblical warrant for the consecutive exposition of God's Word. This is what our Lord did. It's what the apostles did in the synagogues. It's what they instituted in the churches that came out of their ministries. So, there are some of the arguments that the normal pattern of our preaching should be systematic, consecutive exposition. I've hurried through that because I I know I'm preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in that. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we're all convinced and can convince others from the Scriptures that there's biblical warrant for this. So that's why I took the time to do that. But now, I want us to move on to the, the pattern and process. Let me um, end this one and begin another one. I can't get to my little button to click there. All right. So, we want to look then at the process. As I began, the only way that our weekly sermons our weekly expositions consecutively through books of the Bible are going to be biblically accurate and consistently clear is to follow a defined, repeatable, sustainable process. And that's where I want us to go in the rest of our time. Now, let me just give you a couple of caveats as we begin to look at this process. First of all, I'm not presenting myself as some great expert. Remember 1 Timothy 4? We're supposed to all be letting our progress be evident to those around us. I want that as well. I I haven't arrived just like you haven't arrived. We're learning together. So make sure you understand that. I'm striving to let my own progress be evident to my congregation. I'd love for five years from now my congregation to say, you know, he's gotten better. (laughs) You know, that's, that's biblical. That's what's supposed to happen. So none of us have arrived. I'm not. Uh, presenting myself as having arrived. Secondly, I am not suggesting that you have to follow my process exactly. In other words, it's not like, okay, if you don't do it this way, it's not really expository preaching. However, you do need a repeatable process. That's true. And you will need to include all of the elements that I will cover because they're what make expository preaching. And you're going to need to follow a similar workflow simply because, as you will see as I walk through it, it is the logical path. So that's why I trust it will be helpful. It's a synthesis of a process that isn't original with me. Parts here and there are, but it's the people who poured into my life, and I'm simply sharing the fruit of that with you, and maybe it will benefit you. And the third little caveat I need to give is we're not going to be able to deal with every issue in great detail, obviously. When I first presented um, this material in, in this sort of organized way, I've, I've taught this in a number of places with some of the TMAI, TMAI training centers around the world, but uh, I did a winter at Master Seminary back a number of years ago, and I had 27 hours to do this. So we're not going to cover everything to the same degree that it deserves to be covered. But, uh, but we do want to cover all the, the key issues. Now, as we get started, we need to review the two most important words for a preacher. They're the two most important words because they summarize everything we do. The first word is exegesis, and the second word is exposition. Exegesis and exposition. I'm going to use those words a lot. To exegete is to draw out from a text all the truth that is in it. That's to exegete, to draw out from a text the truth that is in it. 
To exposit means to expose, to make visible, to make known, to show something for what it really is. It it suggests shedding light on a subject. Expository preaching begins with exegesis, drawing out from the text the truth that's there, and ends with exposition, that is making that truth visible, exposing that truth to your listeners. Both are crucial. Without exegesis, a sermon is just you talking, and there's a whole lot of that that goes on today. But without exposition, the message is just going to be a technical collection of grammatical and historical details without a point and just a sort of running commentary. So, you need both. You need exegesis, drawing out the truth of the text, and exposition, crafting from that a, an expository sermon. We're going to examine both parts of the process. So, just to remind you of what we're doing, we find ourselves then, having looked at the arguments, we're going to move on and talk about exegesis, studying the biblical text. Walt Kaiser writes this, exegesis is the practice of and set of procedures for discovering the author's intended meaning. That's a great definition. Exegesis is the practice of and set of procedures for discovering the author's intended meaning. We're talking about inductive Bible study. That's an approach to the Scripture that starts with the particulars and from understanding the particulars and details arrives at the meaning, the interpretation of a passage. One common illustration of this process, perhaps you've heard it or read it, is um, imagine that you decided that you were going to study frogs. Now, why you'd want to do that, I don't know, but just stay with me for a moment. Imagine you were going to study frogs you could take two basic approaches to that process. One approach would be to go to the local library and amass all of the experts' opinions about frogs and to digest their opinions. You could learn about their life cycle, their habitat, their diet, etc. The problem with that approach is you're forced to take the experts' word for it. And as you know, experts disagree You would never know for sure if the expert's assertions about frogs were true. You just have to take him at his word. The other approach is to set out to personally study frogs. You could spend days and weeks at the local ponds observing and taking careful notes of all the aspects of their behavior. You could keep a couple of frogs living in your home so you could continue to observe how they live and behave. After one of your little frogs dies, you could dissect its slimy green body and and study its anatomy firsthand. When you're done with that study, you have a thorough inductive knowledge of frogs. Then you could read the experts, and you would see much of what you've already learned. You would learn new facts from the experts as well, but you will be in a much better place to evaluate those expert opinions because you've done your own firsthand research. Undoubtedly, you'd find some of your own understanding of frogs challenged, confronted, so you'd have to reweigh the evidence and maybe you stick with your conclusions or maybe you change your mind, but you are in such better place to deal with the opinions of the experts when you've done your own research first. Sadly, when it comes to Bible study and preaching, Many pastors opt for the first approach. They just read the experts. Turn to the commentaries, let the commentaries tell them what the passage says, and move on. The better approach in any discipline is a healthy measure of inductive first-hand Bible study. Now, the process of inductive Bible study, or exegesis, includes several steps I've condensed it to five distinct steps. First of all, there's preparation, how to study, or how to prepare, rather, to study. Then there's observation. This is what it says. Meditation. This is thinking deeply about it. 
Then there's interpretation. This is determining ultimately what it means. And then there's evaluation. This is what others say it means. This is the experts. These are the steps for inductive Bible study. We're going to begin with step one briefly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but let me just mention it to you. The other four steps have to do with the text that you're studying. This step has to do with preparing yourself and preparing ourselves for study, including our surroundings. What preparations are necessary to be an an effective expositor? As we think about preparation, first of all, you have to prepare yourself in several ways. First of all, you must be regenerate. This is obvious, but John 8, 43, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot. Dunamai, you don't have the power, you don't have the capacity to hear my word because you don't know me. You don't have the spirit. So you have to be regenerate. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. They understand, it's not talking about Jesus calling, you know, outside the scripture. It's talking about his speaking through his word and his sheep hear his voice in his word. You have to be a sheep to really understand the scripture in a life-changing way. You must also, as a Christian, first confess your sin. A couple of texts talk about this. James 1.21, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Putting aside, of course, is a familiar New Testament image. It's it's taking off dirty clothing. Metaphorically, it's talking about taking off evil attitudes and behaviors that were part of our lives before Christ. And specifically, James says, taking off all filthiness, that is all that's morally dirty, and all that remains of wickedness. Everything in your life that's wicked it doesn't mean you have to be perfect to study and understand the Scripture, but it means we first have to repent. We have to confess our sins and deal with our sins before the Lord. We must be willing. Here's what it comes down to. We must be willing before we come to the Word to understand it, to have a heart that's willing to let go of anything the Word tells us to let go of. That's what we're really talking about. No matter how much we currently cherish it whether it's sinful acts, sinful ideas, doctrinal error, repentance for sin has to come first. And then James says, in humility, receive the word. So we have to confess our sin, but that introduces another way we have to prepare ourselves. We have to come with an attitude of humility and dependence, praying for illumination. It was John Owen, and I I wish I had the quote. I have it on my iPad. I refer to it almost every week when I study but John Owen makes a, makes a very profound point about this. He says, do you really think that you can come to the Scripture and without seeking the help of the Holy Spirit who inspired it, come to understand it when it is so far above your station, your ability, your, your place? It's way beyond us. Do we really think we can do that without him? Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Psalm 119, 73, your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. And in the New Testament, Ephesians 1, 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know the things that are yours in Christ. Before we begin to study In a spirit of dependence and humility, we have to ask the Spirit of God to be our teacher. When my kids were young, my wife and I taught them the children's catechism. And, you know, one of the questions says, well, why do I need Christ as a prophet? What's the answer? Because I am ignorant and in need of a teacher. That's the spirit we have to come to the Word of God with. So, this is crucial. Another way we have to prepare ourselves is... We just have to be committed to hard work. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Be diligent is pudazo. It's it's, uh, defined this way by, by Bauer. 
to be especially conscientious in discharging an obligation, to be zealous, to take pains, to make every effort. If you're going to be a serious student of God's Word, you'll find that preparing, in my case, often through the, school, through the school year, two sermons a week, is like researching and writing two 10-page term papers every week. That's what it's like. It's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I remember all the years I was out at Grace with, with John MacArthur, we would travel to pastor's events or other pastors would come in and often they would, eventually there would be kind of the question that came out something like this. So, John, what, what's the secret to a long-term effective preaching ministry? Expecting, I don't know, something esoteric, something really super spiritual sounding. And hundreds of times, I'm confident, I heard John say this, keep your rear in the chair till the work's done. That's it. Yes, we have to depend on the Spirit, but the Spirit isn't going to do the work for us. Keep your rear in the chair till the work's done. That's the only way it happens. R.C. Sproul writes, we fail in our duty to study God's Word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it's dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we're lazy. Newspapers, we could update it to say websites, are easier to read than the Bible is to study, end quote. We have to be committed to hard work. Keep your rear in the chair till the work's done. You know, John challenged us, and he was challenged at, in seminary to spend 30 hours a week in study. If you have two sermons a week, spend 30 hours a week in study. That's been my goal and, and what I've committed to the 19 years I've been here at Countryside. And it pays off in your own life, and it pays off in your ministry. Hard work. So, prepare yourself, but also prepare your surroundings. If you're going to be an expositor, have a set time, your best time of day if possible. Don't relegate your study to your worst time. Make this a priority. Whatever that is for you, it varies. But for me, it's, I have to commit at least a long morning to it. Um, for me, it's all day Wednesday from 6 a.m. till dinner and Friday from 7 a.m. till 5 p.m. and then Saturday evening from about 4, 3 or 4. My wife might argue it's a little earlier, but 3 or 4 to bedtime and then Sunday afternoon. To get in the time, that's how it works. That's what it looks like for me. But I have to have blocks of time. Whatever it is, your best time, set it aside. Set a place that's quiet and free from distractions. Maybe you are one of those one in a thousand guys who really can stay focused at Starbucks, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Turn off and shut out all distractions. Other people you know, I, when I study, I close the door, my door at home. And here, I have windows in my office for obvious reasons. But when I'm studying, nobody else is in there, just me. I close the windows because guess what? If somebody gets my attention, like just my eyes, they've got me. I'm, I'm toast at that point. And so are you. So try to shut out the distractions. Cut off the electronic distractions, all the, you know, TV, radio, music with lyrics, chimes, dings, bells, rings, social media notifications, all of that. You know, now you can set focus on your, on your devices. Have a study focus where only your, your spouse gets through, and your kids or whatever, but you can do that. Surround yourself with the necessary resources, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because many of you are this is, uh, this is your life. But just to remind you what those resources are, obviously in today's world, computer software is really helpful. I have both Lagos and Accordance. Uh, you may have others, uh, but you need a good Bible software. Original language resources, if you, if you know the languages, or an English translation based on formal equivalents. Let me tell you what I mean. If you don't know Greek or Hebrew, here's what I mean. There are 
When it comes to translations into English, there are three translation philosophies. There's what's called formal equivalence. That's word-for-word equivalence as much as possible. Uh, The English Standard Version, the New American Standard, those are formal equivalence Bibles. Then there's what's called dynamic equivalence. This is concept equivalence. The New International Version, the New English Bible, the New Living Translation. And then you have paraphrase, where it's just the author's interpretation of the original. Phillips, the Living Bible. Now, let me show you how different that looks. Here is one text, Romans 3.21, starting with formal equivalence. So read the, new, the NAS first. That's very close, almost exact to the Greek text. Now go down and read the last one. And you can see the difference. And even just get back up to the NLT, the New Living, which presents itself as a translation. But notice they go concepts not words. Well, if you're studying, you don't want concepts. Why? Because that's interpretation. That's like reading a commentary. They're not telling you what the text says. They're telling you what they think the text says. And so for study, you want as close as you can get to the original. If you know Greek and Hebrew, there you go. If you don't, a formal equivalence Bible like the NAS or even the ESV. So you need, a, you need that is key. Ready reference resources. I'll mention more about that in a minute. Uh, For me, I usually have 10 to 15 commentaries on the biblical book I'm teaching through. For some of you, that's impractical. If you're a leader and, you know, an elder, a lay elder in a church, uh, maybe you don't have that many, but you need more than one because you want them to argue with each other so that you can sit in and watch and decide which one has the better argument and not just buying one person's opinion. A highlighter and markers, some way to to uh, mark the things you're reading and, and note them. I'm a pen guy, so I have pens, uh, fountain pens, personally I love. That's the starting place. I use a computer as well. I'll talk more about that in a minute. A legal pad, something to make notes on as you're, as you're picking things up and studying. This is necessary whether you start with a computer or not because it's really hard to take notes on a computer when you're reading resources and so forth. So something you can quickly jot down spots. Uh, I like book stands, and uh, my mentors have used them. Basically, they're just things that hold your books up where you can see several of them at one time. They're cheap ones you can get. I have several metal ones in both both offices as well as some wooden ones so that I can have my books around me um, nested in. And then bibliography. I'm going to give you as a one of the things we'll send you afterwards, a bibliography of what I would say are some of the most important books for you to build toward having as a Bible student. Um, and the ones that are starred in this list I'll send you are the most helpful. Start with them, and then you can build to the others, but they're all books that I use and benefit from as a ready reference. And I have some of them are so important, I have them both at both my home office and my church office because I use them in both places. So, prepare yourself, prepare your surroundings, and then, of course, this is obvious, but choose a biblical book. Hopefully, weeks or months before you begin to preach through a book, you need to decide what that book will be. I'm already thinking about what my next study will be. I'm I'm in 1 John. I think I'm 24 messages into 1 John, somewhere in the first part of chapter 3. And I'm already thinking of what's coming next. And same thing, I'm doing Revelation on Sunday night. I'm halfway through Revelation. I'm thinking about what what am I doing next. I'm even thinking about what I'm doing after that in a couple of cases because I want to begin to get my mind and heart into it. So you want to start planning. You say, how do you decide what book? Well, I would suggest several criteria, specifically three criteria. First of all, consider the needs of your flock. For example, don't start with Timothy or Titus. Now, they're very beneficial books, but to whom were those books written? To church leaders. They're spiritually beneficial, but not as appropriate as other books can be. So think about the needs of your congregation. Secondly, ask feedback of your elders, if you have other elders. And then I would encourage you to start in this process with a New Testament book. As Augustine put it, the new is in the old concealed the old is in the new revealed. And so, um, and start with the, the full 
New Testament explanation, and then you can bring in the Old Testament and eventually preach Old Testament books as well. I'm not suggesting you don't. I'm just saying start there. Just some thoughts. I, I could walk you through, and I have in my notes sort of my own choices through the years, but I don't know that that's as beneficial as some other things we'll discuss. So you choose a biblical book. Now let me just comment on topical messages. Although the biblical pattern, as we've seen, is weighted in favor of consecutive exposition, there are also biblical examples of sermons that were more topical. So interspersed throughout the book studies that I do, I also include series on key topics. For example, when I first came to Countryside, I did four years on Sunday night of systematic theology because uh, the elders and I all thought it was really important for our church. Um, I did a 13-message overview, and for me, this was really hard, but a 13-message overview of the Old and New Testament, give the people the big picture. I did uh, one-message overviews, or have done, of individual books. I've done short series on themes like evangelism, marriage, parenting, biblical philosophy of ministry, our church's distinctives, worship, the Lord's Prayer, Bible study, the transgender issue, social justice. So I'm not suggesting that you don't do those things, but those ought to be interspersed into the larger, into the larger priority of consecutive exposition. Of course, I also often preach special messages for communion, for holidays, and so forth. So, preparation is key. Yourself, your surroundings, your book choice. And so, that's where it starts with preparation. Now, that brings us then to observation. Once you have completed preparation, you come to this second step in exegesis, observation. This is really... When we talk about exegesis, we're talking about studying the biblical text, and observation is at the heart of exegesis. In fact, I would say it is the heart of exegesis. What is this? Exegesis is using careful reading, thought, and analysis, along with all the available tools to systematically study the details of the text in order to arrive at its meaning. The goal of the observation step is to discover what the original author intended to say. It answers the question, what does this really say? I love the illustration uh, that Jim Shaddix includes in his book, The Passion Driven Sermon. He writes this, several years ago, one of the great Bible expositors of our day was teaching a pastor's training school on the value of using various Bible study tools for sermon preparation. During a discussion time, a young man posed an important question to him. Sir, he asked, don't you think it's important for me just to get alone with God and find out what the Holy Spirit is saying to me? The preacher's answer was shocking. Young man, he replied, I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. In fact, You may be surprised to know that I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Then he explained, all I'm interested in is what the Holy Spirit is saying. And the Holy Spirit has been saying the same thing through a passage of Scripture since the day he inspired it. And I'm going to use every available means that I have to find out what that is. This is contrary to what happened in the early days of the church. You're familiar with with allegorical interpretation, where you all these different layers of meaning. For example, every reference to the city of Jerusalem has four levels of meaning in the allegorical approach. Literally, it's the historical city. Allegorically, it's the church. Morally, it's the human soul. Eschatologically, it's the heavenly Jerusalem. And everywhere then that, the, that Jerusalem is referred to, they would read all four of those levels of meaning in. And it meant all of those things in all of those places. But with the Reformation, a new day dawned, not only for the doctrine of salvation and justification by faith, but also for the priority of and the treatment of the Word of God. Luther put it this way, I love this, the Holy Ghost is the all-simplest writer that is in heaven or earth. Therefore, his words can have no more than one simplest sense, which we call the scriptural or the literal meaning. Calvin 
said, it is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what happens all the time. So how do we approach this process? We do so systematically. Again, listen to Luther. First, I shake the whole tree that the ripest fruit may fall. Then I climb the tree and shake each limb, and then each branch, and then each twig, and then I look under each leaf. What's he talking about? He's saying he keeps drilling down. He starts with a big picture, and then he, he keeps taking it apart and looking at its components and its elements and its parts and studying each of them in greater detail. What he's really saying is I go from looking at the passage as a whole to looking at the individual words and the meanings of those words and everything in between. It's systematic. So what are you looking for during the observation stage? Or to put it another way, what are we trying to observe the author's original meaning is what we're after, but that can only be discerned by understanding the details, what's under every leaf, what the branches are, and what the limbs are, what the larger limbs are. So in observation then, we are looking at, first of all, context. The historical context, the setting of the book in human history, as well as the biblical context the relationship of the paragraph or section to the surrounding passages, the rest of the book, and to the entire message of Scripture. Context. That's what we're looking at. Secondly, we're looking at content. And content comes in two ways. It comes in what's called syntax, which is just the relationship of phrases and clauses to one another, and words, the exact sense that the words, uh, the exact sense of the words that the author intended. So that's what we're looking for, but let's go back and consider this process. What does this process look like? Now I'm going to give you a number of steps in this process of observation. Some of them happen before your weekly study, so don't, don't get scared when you see the list, all right? Some of them happen earlier in the process, but I want to give them all to you so you have the big picture. It starts, by the way, with just that. Observation begins with remembering the big picture. When you come to an individual passage to study it, you have to remember the big picture, and this is the big picture of Scripture. Now, maybe you disagree with this, but this is what I believe the theme of the Bible is. I derived this from a study of John 17. The theme of the Bible is God is redeeming a people by His Son for His Son to His own glory. That's what the Bible's about. So everything in the Bible, including that passage I'm studying, somehow ties back to that theme. If you don't agree with my theme, whatever your theme of Scripture is, every passage you study ties back to that theme. Then you have to remember the purpose of the Testaments, wherever you're studying. If it's in the Old Testament, the Old Testament says he's coming, and here's why he needs to come how bad, desperately bad things are. The New Testament, the Gospels tell us he came, and Acts and the Epistles tell us this is what his coming meant, and Revelation tells us he's coming again. So as you come to your text, you have to put it in the overall context of the Scripture. Don't ever lose sight of the big picture when you come to whatever that text is you're studying. It fits into that big picture. Don't let don't forget it and don't let your people forget it. So remember the big picture. Secondly, research the book's general introduction. And by general introduction, I mean all the, the sort of circumstances and settings of when this book was written. By the way, you should do this with any book. If you haven't read Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book, he was once the editor, the uh, editor in chief of Encyclopedia Britannica. And he wrote a book called How to Read a Book. And it's really helpful. But this is what he says. You, you don't start reading at chapter 1. You start by reading the front and the back and the, the front matter. And, and you're, you're acquainting yourself with the whole picture so you have the big picture. And then you're able to put it in the larger context. So this is what you're doing. How do you do this? How do you get a picture of, let's say you're studying Ephesians. How do you get that general introduction to Ephesians? Ephesians. 
Very simply, two ways. First of all, read the introductions in some good study Bibles, like the MacArthur Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible, even the NIV Study Bible can be helpful. It's good if you have more than one, so you get a couple of different, again, you're, you're letting the experts argue with each other, and you're sitting watching and seeing who convinces you based on the value and benefit of their arguments. Secondly, another way you can learn the book's general introduction is read the introductions in your commentaries. All of that front matter that happens before it gets to the verse by verse, read those. At least the best commentaries you have. You don't have to read, if you have 10 to 15, you don't have to read that in every one of them, but choose the ones that you believe are best and read that, that introductory material. But you need to get acquainted with the summary of the book and the key issues. So, this is where it begins. Thirdly, as you continue observation, read through the book multiple times. Somewhere, and the experts vary on this, the advice varies, somewhere between 10 and 30 times, read through the book that you're planning to teach. You see why you have to start this, you know, not like the week before you're going to be starting to preach through or teach through a book. If you study a larger book, you may want to break your repetitive reading down into sections. Um, You want to know what's in this book. Read it with a first-time attitude as if you've never read it before. Read in other translations, even paraphrases, just so you're you're seeing it with fresh eyes. Read quickly with with that first-time attitude repeatedly and in different versions. Why? What are your goals in this in this reading through multiple times and surveying it, first of all, you're looking for the theme of the book. What, what is this book about? Sometimes it comes in an explicit statement. I love it when that happens. You know, Luke is great. He tells us, here's why I wrote in Luke and Acts. John ends his gospel with, you know, I could have written a lot of things, but I wrote these things so that you may know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and the believing you might have life in his name. But not all of them do that. So you're looking. Sometimes it's the repetition of certain phrases, like in Genesis, these are the generations of. Sometimes it's exhortations, which often flow from purpose. So you're looking for the theme of the book. You're looking for its setting, for the author and the audience, for the date that it was written, and a basic outline of the book. You're trying to discern the big picture of what it is about. Now, Let me just, as you think about a book, let me just show you, if I can get this uh, to work here, like it's supposed to work. Yeah, here we go. When you think about a book, understand this. You have, first of all, and I'm not a great uh, great, uh, artist on the iPad, so you just have to tolerate this. But first of all, you have the theme of the book. And the book as a whole. So let's take, for example, since I just finished seven years in Romans, let's take Romans. And what's the theme of Romans? It's the gospel of God. That's how he introduces his book, and that's how he develops it. Now, everything in Romans, except the introduction and conclusion, is about what? The gospel of God. But it's not all at the same level. It's broken down into large sections. So, for example, you have after the introduction, let's, not, let's just cut off the first 17 verses and say that's introduction. But beginning in chapter 1, verse 18, and running through chapter, chapter 3, verse 20, you have a large section that says something about the gospel. But when you read it, guess what? There's not a lot of hope there. Why? Because it's presenting the need for the gospel. It's showing why we need the gospel. And he starts in chapter 1 with a pagan who doesn't say he believes in the true God. And then he goes in chapter 2 to the Jew, the person who says he worships the true God but doesn't really know him or worship him. And then in chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, running down to verse 20, it's all of mankind. So, here you have then the need for the gospel. And that is broken down, as I said, in terms of pagan, 
Jew, and all our humanity. Okay? But what I want you to see, the point I'm trying to make is that as you're studying a book, think of it as that sort of tree that develops. You have a theme of the book. Once you land on a theme for the book, everything in that book except potentially the introduction and conclusion, although even that will relate, but everything else in that book is going to be about that theme if you've got the right theme. That means every major section somehow is explaining that theme. But guess what? If chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20 is talking about the need for the gospel, then that means that everything in that section is going to be about what? The need for the gospel. So somehow it's going to be explaining the need for the gospel, and it's very clear when you study it. The pagans need for the gospel in chapter 1, the Jews need for the gospel in chapter 2 through chapter uh, 3, verse 8, and then beginning in chapter 3, verse 9, through down through verse 20, everybody, all humanity. So you, you see what I'm saying? When you're looking at your text, let's say you're preaching a paragraph from Peter, that doesn't stand in isolation. It ties back up to a larger section and that section is explaining something about the entire theme of the book. So you're always thinking up. You're always thinking back to how does this tie to the theme of the book? How does this tie to the theme of the book? What section is this then? And what is this section telling me about this theme? So this is absolutely crucial as you're going through survey, as you're reading the Scripture and reading it multiple times, you're thinking, this is, what, this is what it looks like. This is how it breaks down, how it ties back to the theme. The next step, then, is to identify the paragraphs in prose or identify the stanzas in poetry. You've got to break it down like we were just talking about. You have to break it down. And how does that work? How do you do that? Understand that in the ancient world, writing materials were costly. And so, manuscripts, for example, of the New Testament were not broken down by chapter, paragraph, or verse. And sometimes with certain manuscripts called the unseals, not even by word. In other words, they were just crushed together because of the value of writing materials. And so, it's like, it's like a word search, you know. The, all the words are stuck together. Verse divisions were only added to our English Bibles with the Geneva Bible in 1560. So, you're looking for breaks. You're looking for paragraphs. Why? Because that's where your single thought is. Paragraphs is the unit at which you find one idea. So, you're looking to where are the paragraphs. And the paragraph breaks in our Scripture are not inspired, they're just educated, informed suggestions by the translators. How can you go about identifying them? Because it's crucial. You've got to figure out where the thought units are. So how do you do that? Well, if you know Greek and Hebrew, you can look at the, the paragraph units in your Greek and Hebrew scriptures, which show the suggestions of the scholars who compiled it in many cases. You can also look at English translations. And here's how it works in English. In prose, that is non-poetry, it's either, uh, maybe your translation is arranged by paragraph, so it's really clear, and the, the verses are all buried inside the paragraph, or um, you have a bolded verse number. If, like the translation I have, all the verses go out to the left margin. So I can just look down the left margin, and there's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so forth. But the ones that are the new paragraphs, as the translators believe they begin, are bolded to indicate that they think that's where a new paragraph begins. In, in poetry, there's either an extra return, white space, or there's a bolded verse number to let you know this is what the translators thought is where the breaks came. You can use commentaries. Commentaries will, they'll break it up. The, again, the experts will tell you this is where we think the divisions come. And of course, your own survey as you read. By using these basic tools, you're going to have a pretty good idea where the paragraph breaks in prose occur and where the 
the stanza breaks in poetry occur. Now, why is this important? Because the principal feature of a paragraph is a unifying theme. It's the most natural way to organize your study and your sermons, even if it takes several messages to get through it. So, for example, I'm in a paragraph right now in 1 John. It begins with the last, the last couple of verses of chapter 2 and runs down through the verse 10 of chapter 3. That's one paragraph. It's one unified, it's bound together by one unified thought, and I'm, it's taking me several weeks to get through it, but it's one unit of thought, and so that becomes the preaching text. Now, the length of the passage is relative to the nature of the text. If it's a narrative section, it may be a longer, more verses. If it's uh, instruction, like in the epistles, it may be smaller units but you're looking for the natural divisions of the text. It could be, by the way, an expository sermon. Let me just summarize. It can be over an entire book. You can preach an expository sermon in a kind of a survey form of a book. You can do it on a section of a book. You can do it on a chapter. You can do it on a paragraph, and that is the most common focus of expository preaching. So primarily, the preaching unit that you're going to be studying is going to be a paragraph in prose or a stanza in poetry. Now, those steps, take a look at those steps. Remember the big picture. Research the general introduction. Read through the book multiple times. Identify the paragraphs or stanzas. All of those come before you start your week-to-week study and preaching through the book. So think of those as preliminaries. Preliminaries. So, you've identified the paragraphs, you've identified the stanzas, you have an idea of what their themes are, you're ready to study the first paragraph or section. Where do you begin? You begin by analyzing the syntax. Analyzing the syntax. This involves the study of grammar. Now, I know when I say the word grammar, Some of you get cold chills. Brings back terrible memories of high school, college, whatever. But but grammar is not as foreign to you as you think. You analyze grammar every time you read a road sign. You come to a road sign and it says, slow children ahead. You use grammar. And you conclude it doesn't mean that there are children who maybe aren't the sharpest ahead you understand that means you should slow down because there are children ahead. That's grammar. Um, Even T-shirts. Have you seen the T-shirt that says, let's eat grandma with no comma? And then it says, commas save lives. Because technically, that means let's eat grandma. You need a comma to mean it, let's eat together, grandma. So you analyze grammar every time you read anything. And certainly when you read the Bible, grammar is nothing more than the rules by which language communicates meaning. Now, let me give you a a brief grammar lesson. Syntax is just the relationship of clauses and phrases and how they're connected. And so let me make sure you know what clauses and phrases are. This is not complicated. When I was in grad school, I taught English on the undergrad level Trust me, this is simple. I'm not going to take you through anything hard if you don't like English. But this is important. First of all, a clause is a part of a sentence that contains a subject and a verb. It's part of a sentence that contains a subject and a verb. There are two types of clauses. There are independent clauses, a clause that expresses a complete thought or stands alone, a complete sentence like Charlie ate supper, stands alone. There are dependent clauses. This is a clause that does not express a complete thought, cannot stand alone. It's not a complete sentence. While Charlie ate supper, when Charlie ate supper, as Charlie ate supper. You're never going to walk up to somebody and say that, right? That's not. It's dependent on other things. But they're still clauses because they contain a subject and a verb. So, there are clauses. Then there are phrases. A phrase is just a group of words in a sentence without a subject and a verb. And the most common of these is a prepositional phrase. 
This is a group of words without a verb that's introduced by a preposition. Now, three you're just going to have to learn. Three common prepositions are of, with, and about. Just learn them. But the rest of the prepositions are anything that a squirrel can be to a stump or an airplane can be to a cloud. In, under, above, through, you get the idea. Those are prepositions. The second kind of phrase is a verbal phrase. This is a group of words without a main verb. There are participles, and I'm not going to drill down into this too much, but basically you have present participles that are verb plus ing that function like an adjective. Hearing the phone ring, I answered it. Past participle is the verb plus ed, stunned by the blow, Mike gathered his senses. Those are not normal main verbs, but they're verbs. A couple of other forms real quickly. A gerund is just a verb form that functions like a noun. Always the verb plus ing. Waiting for a text message kept me glued to my cell phone. Waiting for a text message is a gerund. It's a verb form that's not a true verb. Infinitive is the most common, easy to recognize, two plus a verb. And it's used in a couple of different ways. Now, why do I tell you all that? Because you need to know clauses and phrases to analyze the syntax of the passage you're studying. Because the key to analyzing grammar or syntax is breaking the text down into smaller units. You identify the main clause, the sentences, subject, and verb. Then you identify all the other phrases and clauses. And then you understand their relationship to each other. This is how, this is how it works to understand a text. Now, what is the best tool for analyzing syntax, the relationship of phrases and clauses to each other? I would recommend to you a block diagram. Now, don't be scared. This is actually simple if you haven't done it. Um, I'll show you what it's like. It doesn't diagram a sentence. Rather, it diagrams the paragraph as a whole. Each phrase and clause is kept in the natural order of the passage that, uh, as it appears in the text, indented under what they modify, and it arranges um, it so that there's a visual glance at how the passage unfolds. I'm going to show you this, so don't, if you're not catching this, you'll see it, and I think it'll be a lot clearer. And this concept, if you want to study it more, because I'm just touching on it, is developed in Walt Kaiser's book, Toward an Exegetical Theology, which I would highly recommend to you. The quickest and best way to do block diagramming is on your computer. Now, again, stay with me. This is going to become clear. When you're looking at for these clues as to what's going on in the text, you're looking for grammatical keys, little words that have a large influence on the meaning of the text. Here, is an, here are examples. Look at the words on the, on the right. These are key words. These are words that mark phrases and clauses. And, or, but, for, because, since, as, that, so that, by, from, through, out of. You get the idea. This isn't a comprehensive list, but this shows you words that introduce phrases and clauses, and they give meaning to the text. Look at the left-hand column. They give meaning like contrast, cause, reason, result, purpose, time, place, manner. This is where meaning comes in language. You look for these grammatical keys, and you look for t content clues, or cues, rather. Uh, sometimes the structure of the text can be discerned by by content changes, by a new subject that shows up, repetition, and by a change in, in the form of the statement from declarations to imperatives. Like the classic example is Ephesians 1 to 3, which is declaration statements, and 4 to 6, which is imperatives. So you look for those sorts of things. Very quickly then, how do you actually do block diagramming? Well, you identify all possible markers of structure. Here's an example. Let's take a non-biblical sentence. Bob came home from work to rest because he was tired. 
Now, when you look at that sentence, you're looking for those little markers, those words that indicate, that introduce phrases or clauses. From is one of those words, to is another, and because is another. Three markers. So you identify all the markers. Then you separate the major markers from the minor markers. Richards writes in his book, Richard writes in his book, just as bodies have big bones and little bones to connect and separate various parts from others, so biblical texts and all good writing feature big bones and little bones. You will use your interpretive judgments along with those of others to understand the major and minor divisions of your text. So back to our sentence. Bob came from work to rest because he was tired. What is the most important marker in that verse? It's because because it connects two parts of a sentence, okay? So you're looking for those words that indicate meaning, and then you want to understand the meaning of those markers. Again, Bob came home from work to rest because he was tired, because, here's the reason, from refers to place, to shows purpose. This is how you understand a text. So you understand the meaning of them, and then you outline the text according to the importance of those uh, in a block diagram. Now, let me give you some examples. This will make it much clearer, I hope. Let's take Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. What are the markers in that verse? For, to, of, and, to, and, to, and, and, in. All of those introduce phrases or clauses. So they tell you this is what gives meaning to this verse. So you go through then and you do, this is a block diagram. All I've done is I have indented the things that modify. And so four connects back to the previous verse. Ezra had set his heart. There's the main part of the verse. Set his heart what? To study the law. And whose law? The law of the Lord. He'd set his heart to study and to practice and to teach. Now, you can see there is a visual representation. All I've done is indent what modifies what's above it. Can you see that? Everybody see how that works? Now, all I have to do then is go back and give what does it mean? What, what are the meaning of these expressions? Well, for is the reason for the previous verse. It says, the good hand of God was upon him for, because, Ezra had set his heart. There's the main proposition of the sentence. Ezra set his heart what? The goal was to study the law. The goal was to practice it and to teach it. His statutes is the content of the law. His ordinances is the content of the law. And in Israel is to whom or where. I now understand that text. I know what that text is teaching. That's a simple one, but you get the idea. Let's go to a more complicated one. Here's the command to wives in Ephesians 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So, You see, I've gone through and I've marked those little words that introduce phrases and clauses, those markers. Now, I'm going to do, I'm going to indent those different phrases and clauses under what they modify. So, wives, be subject, and then to your own husbands is, modifies be subject, as to the Lord modifies be subject, and for the husband is the head, modifies be subject. And you can see I've done this all through here. So there is a picture of this text, a visual picture of what this text means. Now I go back and assign meaning. Wives be subject. There's the main subject and verb. To your own husbands. That says to whom they're to be subject. As to the Lord, how? For the husband is the head. Here's the reason. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head There's a comparison, and Christ is the head of the church. But as the church is subject, here's another comparison, to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands, to whom, in everything, to what extent. 
Now, there's my message. It's unfolding. I now understand the flow of the author's thought. Now, do you, do you see what I'm doing here? I'm going through a text. I'm identifying clauses and phrases. And the way I'm identifying phrases and clauses is I'm looking for those little words that show the introduction to a phrase or clause. And then I'm saying, what modifies what? And I'm indenting under what it modifies, and then I'm identifying what it means. And when, when I'm done with this, I can look at that and tell you what this passage is about. The, what's the thrust of this passage based on what's farthest out to the left that everything else is modifying? Wives be subject. That's what this passage is about. And everything else develops that idea. It, it says to whom, it says to what extent, it says in what way, tells me why. So now when I go to put together my outline of this text, what am I going to do? I'm going to follow my block diagram, and it's going to drive my outline. So I'm not only preaching the meaning of the text, but I'm even going to structure my message in keeping with the structure the Holy Spirit inspired. I'm going to follow his structure in creating my message, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow, how that works. Now, let me just say that block diagramming, if you've not done it, in fact, let me just I'm just curious, how many of you currently use block diagramming in your study? Okay. If you've never tried this before, you're looking at this going, well, that looks complicated. But it's like any new skill. It looks complicated until you practice. The first time you went to ride a bike, was it easy? Of course not. The first time you went to drive a car, was it simple to do? Was it easy no, it felt uncomfortable because you weren't accustomed to it. You had to develop the habit. I'm encouraging you to consider this because it will help you break down the text and follow the flow of the author's thought. But you will have to learn it slowly and gradually. Once you have completed a block diagram, you have a visual display of the flow of the original author's thought and argument. What I have right there is what Paul intended to communicate, and it's what the Holy Spirit ultimately intended to communicate, and I can work with that. I can now explain this to my people because I see what the Holy Spirit is saying in his word. So, with block diagramming, you want to follow three key principles. Use the biblical text closest to the original that you have. If you know the original language, do it in the original language. If you don't, use a formal equivalence Bible where in English you've got the closest to the original language that you can get. Secondly, remember that this is a skill and not an exact science. If I took everybody in this room who's, who does block diagramming now and I brought us all up and I ask us to diagram this, our, our variations, there will be variations. Not huge variations, I don't believe, but there will be variations because there's also some art to this and there's difference in interpretation. So there are going to be some differences. So don't think there's like one perfect way to do every passage and if I don't get that, I've blown it. No, it's a skill you're developing and learning as you go through this process. And a third thing to remember with block diagramming is as I said, only practice is going to make you more comfortable and accurate with the skill. But back to the big picture. What are we trying to do? We want to understand the author's original meaning, and we want to understand the author's original flow of thought. Block diagramming is simply a tool, a very effective tool. I believe the most effective tool that I'm aware of more than sentence diagramming, more than other things, it is the most effective tool for helping you to discern the flow of the author's thought because you, meaning is in the relationships of those phrases and clauses to each other. And as you see how they're related to each other in a block diagram, you understand the meaning and flow of the argument, okay? So again, that deserves so much more time 
than I've just given it. And some of you, you know, it's drinking from a fire hose and, and you feel a little lost. Don't. Get into it. Practice it. If you're interested, you can go and listen to the fuller development of this that I've done at Master Seminary. That's all online. Um, and I've done a, a two hours on this issue here at Countryside. You can find that on our website. But that is a really thumbnail sketch of block diagramming. But don't dismiss it. It's really, really a helpful tool to understand the flow of the author's thought. And when you're done, that, that will preach itself. Once you see that, you're not making up anything. You're capturing the meaning of the text in the flow of the author's thought, and you can preach that. You can structure that. I'll show you how to translate that into an outline tomorrow, but it preaches. And you're not preaching your outline. You're preaching the Holy Spirit's outline. All right? Well, I think we're supposed to be done for for dinner. So um, let me pray and... um, and we'll transition. Somebody will tell us what we're supposed to do. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time this, in this session. Lord, so much that we've surveyed and studied together, but I pray that you would drive these truths into our hearts. Give us, give us a commitment to where we started, that our progress would be evident to the people we serve. And Lord, most of all to you, that we would be faithful stewards. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.